Hi, good evening, everyone. Grace and peace. Uh, my name is Brett, and uh, I'm the pastor here, and it's just wonderful to be with you all. Thank you for being here on a, a chilly, chilly evening. Um, so this is, um, well, I want to, before I keep going, I want to um, also give a warm welcome to those joining us online. We love you lots. I know there's uh, more than usual tonight, lots of texts from people saying they're joining us online. Um, and uh, and also want to give a warm welcome to everyone who's uh, new. Thank you so much for being here. I know it can take a, you know just some courage to walk through those doors and come into a new place and a new people and you know all that. So uh, thank you for being with us. Um, so we, this is a really special night because at the the very first Sunday of the year um, we uh, always um, do what we call Story Sunday, and it's basically where we have a few folks um, who share the story of kind of what they, their journey, the last, sometimes it's year, sometimes it's even extends beyond that if it's been kind of a, you know, an ongoing theme. Um, and we, um, you know, kind of one of our assumptions here is that um, God is with us and that Christ is present and that he is doing a good work in our lives. He's up to something. And um, there's a, a passage, it's from John um, chapter 15, uh, verses 6 through 27, um, and it's Jesus speaking. Um, and he says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And I love that verse because it's such a beautiful description of how um, the Holy Spirit is present to each one of us. I don't think there's like anyone in the world that is somehow absent from God. You know, but like the Spirit is present. And especially as like followers of Christ, like of course the Spirit is present to us since the Christ is present to the Spirit. And he's doing that good thing in our life. And um, and so tonight we get to kind of hear from a few folks who get to share about the something that God has been up to. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's always like a neat and tidy little story that's like, well, I used to have challenges in my life, but now all that's over and done with, you know, um, just onward and upward. <laughs> um, it's messy, right? Like, because life is messy. Um, we're just human beings. And yes, God's doing a good thing. But it, that doesn't mean, like, the process is all, like, smooth and easy. Um, it can be really, really messy. And at times in ways unresolved, you know. So um, just know the, the folks um, that we have sharing tonight. I've given them full permission to be themselves, to be where they're at. They don't have to, like, pretend to have, I don't know, like, more faith than they actually maybe really have. Or um, to even make it more neat and tidy, you know, than it really um, was or is even now. So... Um, all that to say, I do think there will be things you can um, kind of glean because um, at the end of the day, like God is, God is present, Christ is present to, to them and, and us. So I hope you are able to glean something beautiful um, from their stories. So uh, with that in mind, I want to invite Brittany Johnson up. Y'all give her a hand. She comes up. Brittany, grab that mic. Your favorite. You love being in front of people with a microphone. <laughs> um, Brittany, Brittany and I, we've been friends for a very long time. And um, something I really appreciate about Brittany, well, a few things. One is she is very attuned to other people and their, their needs. Um, just very, like, sensitive and thoughtful. And that will actually, I think, play out some in her story later. Um, but I do love that about her. And I also, um, I love that she is like a laid back person. I am not a laid back person. And so I really respect people who can like be in the midst of chaos and it's like, it's okay. And uh, I mean, this is why I think maybe she's graced to help lead our kids ministry. Um, Lord knows there can be some chaos back there. Um, so I'll have to say, thank you, Brittany. I know they are being quiet. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're treating you well. Yeah. Um, so Brittany, can you kind of um, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little background for those who maybe don't know you, whether it's, you know, where you live, family situation, how you found the table, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm Brittany. I'm married to Scott, who is usually in the sound booth. He's not tonight. Um, we live in Rowlett. We have three children. Elle is in sixth grade. Lorelai is in fourth grade. And Trace is in second grade. <laughs> um, and we 
like Brett said, we've been friends with Brett and Maggie for a really long time. It's been 14 years. And a few years ago, they asked us to be on the launch team for um, a church. And of course, we knew if they were going, we were going with them. There wasn't really, Brett did ask us to take some time to think about it and pray about it, but we already knew our answer. Um, and then while we were at that church, I took over the kids' ministry there after about a year. And then when he asked us to launch the table, of course, we said yes. Um, so that's how we're here. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. So, um, so you have, um, well, you've been through like a whole kind of process the last few. I mean, it's really been years, plural. Mm -hmm. Right, like not just the last you know six months or a year. Right, um, it's been been quite a thing. And um, like I mentioned, you're naturally pretty attuned to people. You're attuned to their needs. And I kind of think of you as like very much a glue person. For those who are familiar with the Enneagram, um, she's Enneagram Nine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of the peacemaker. You know, it's like the person who can. We're gonna stay together, people, and I'll I'll contort myself in whatever pretzel I have to to make this work. And that's kind of Brittany. Um, so, but, but through doing that, it kind of, um, well, you started to realize that that's maybe, that can sound really good and like, well, what a good person you are, but it's not always kind of healthy. Um, so catch us up a little bit on, you know, kind of some of the process you've been through and how did you start to realize like, oh, maybe this is leading me to operate in ways that aren't always like healthy. Right. Okay, so like Brett said, I am a nine, and we are called the peacemaker, and when most people think of a peacemaker, they think of someone who is like a mediator or just wants everybody to get along. And that is true, but it's a little more complicated than that, and it gets unhealthy because while I will, like with the people I trust, I will dive into conflict. I'll press into it. I'll work through it. I don't want to be in conflict. And if there is conflict, I don't run away from it. But I will do everything I can to avoid that conflict ever coming up. So in a lot of ways, that means that I'm losing myself. And I'm, I'm in a very unhealthy place because I'm going to go to great lengths to make sure that everything is peaceful. Yeah. And I'll talk more about it. Yeah. When, wait, so when did you realize this like was, this is a thing, like, hmm, I've got some issues here and I'm kind of, uh, like the way you put it was, I'm doing everything I can to make sure we avoid the conflict happening. Like, so when did this start to come on your radar as like, oh, this is a, a real challenge for me? I'm gonna go back a little bit um, to college. I was a psychology major and in almost every class we talked about codependency and I, but I remember the first time we talked about it, it made me very uncomfortable. But I realized it was because it felt so familiar. And when you're in, when you're in college and taking all these psychology classes, the first thing every professor will tell you is not to read into everything that you're learning and because you're gonna see yourself in everything. And so I was able to dismiss it, like, oh, that's not me. You know, it just feels that way because I'm, you know, like everybody else, I see myself in everything. So um, but that's really when like this the seed of like this is a struggle for me was planted. But um then, you know, year fast forward to just a couple of years ago, I had a really big falling out with my best friend. And um it was then I started going to therapy and realized this hurt so much because I was in a codependent relationship and it was very unhealthy. And I mean, it was, I had a lot of depression, had a lot of anxiety. I was, I, I couldn't fully function. I mean, I was doing the things I was supposed to do. I was taking care of my kids. I was going to work, I was showing up, but I wasn't, I wasn't all there. I wasn't fully functioning. So that's really when I started to realize this is something I need to work on. Yeah, well, can you, Describe a little bit, like, what was that season like for you? I mean, obviously, it wasn't, it doesn't sound like it was good, mm -hmm. but um, what, yeah, I don't know, like, what were you experiencing? What emotions were you experiencing? I don't know, what was the internal I think, sense? I think most of it was anxiety. Um, I mean, that led to moments of depression, but I think most of it was anxiety because my world had just crumbled 
and I didn't know how to pick up those pieces, and I didn't know how to move forward. Yeah, when you say, why world? Well, because when you're in a codependent relationship, <laughs> that's your world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it, it, so for you, it wasn't as simple as like, I have this one valuable relationship, and oh no, that's kind of disintegrating. Right. It was like, it's It's kind of all-consuming. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, even at that point, I didn't really understand that that's what was going on. It wasn't until I started therapy, and um, I knew, like, it had, it had been a few years. I knew I needed therapy. I needed to go to therapy for other things, and just because everybody needs therapy. But um, my <laughs> Scott and I had prioritized marriage counseling, and we couldn't afford for both of us to be in therapy and marriage counseling. It gets expensive. So. Um, Finally, at this point, we were like, no, I really need to do this. I need to, I need to process through this with someone who can help me, you know, figure out and get, get my bearings again. So I started therapy, and um, I started, like, as I'm processing with her, I started going through all the things, like everything that would come up that we would talk about happening and, like, you know, even talking to her about, the relationship and how we existed in that relationship, eventually it got to a point where I could say, oh, this was a codependent relationship. And for me, what that looked like was, um, like I said, like I lost myself in this person. But for me, it was um, because I am, I'm very empathetic and I can feel what everybody's feeling. and. Side note, we lived together. Our families cohabitated together. So it was even like more dysfunctional than just we were best friends and in a codependent relationship. But if I felt like she was stressed out about something, I took it from her. I took that thing, whatever it was. It could have been something big. It could have been um, doing laundry, cooking dinner. Like I did it because in that moment, it kept the peace. Things were peaceful, and I enjoyed doing those things. So it wasn't hard for me to do those things, but I, the reason I was doing it was because I didn't want her to feel stressed. And anytime she felt anxious, I would do everything I could to alleviate that anxiety, even if it meant I was more anxious because of it. And so um, that was that was one one of the things <laughs> that was like a uh, red flag. Hello. Um, and in the midst of that, like, even those things, you know, our friends would sit, would make comments about me doing all of it, and I would just brush it off and say, but I love doing it. Like, I really, I really do love cleaning and cooking and doing laundry, so it wasn't a big deal for me to do it. You but think she's joking, but there's, I mean, right, you really, not. you do. I do. I really love it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of therapeutic for me. It's like getting rid of all the dirtiness. Yeah, so why was it bad then? Um, you know I mean? Well, it was bad because on one hand, I was taking away her ability to do things. Um, I was taking away her, not power, but you know, like I was taking away her adultness and humanness and um, I was allowing her to be dependent on me. And it, it was just creating this very unhealthy, I mean, she wasn't a child. She didn't need me to do her laundry or cook every meal or you know, whatever it was. And so it was taking away this, like, ownership for her. And at the same time, taking away energy from me and creating this constant pattern of tension building and anxiety. And then there would be an explosion in our friendship. And, I mean, even before the major falling out, there was this pattern of that. And, and so it was just unhealthy. I mean, it just wasn't, it's not a healthy way to live, so... Yeah. Uh, the other thing, the other red flag about, I mean, like one of the things I was able to pinpoint was that I had this separation anxiety, which you think of like a toddler being separated from their parents. It was basically like that. Not so much like when she would go to work or, you know, doing everyday things, but going on family vacations. Like I didn't want to go without them. 
I didn't want to do celebrate special occasions without them. Even just going over to friends' houses and hanging out, there was always this like anxiety about it. And in the midst of that, I knew that that was a struggle. I didn't know, though, that it was a bigger, it was a symptom of a bigger problem. I didn't realize that. So, yeah. yeah. I, one thing I really appreciate, even as we process this, this topic some before um, tonight, is I appreciate how you're able to own this. Because I think in hearing it, it might be easy to like hear about the other person and kind of blame. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, how no. dare they let me become codependent with them in this way? Um, versus right. you kind of owning like, well, this isn't so much about like them. Right. This, that... this was in no way <laughs> her fault. Um, I, I had no boundaries in the relationship. And boundaries are something that I struggle with in all of my relationships, including like with my children. But um, <laughs> I just, I don't have boundaries. People have told me that I'm not very approachable or that I come across as snobby. But once you're my friend, I will do everything. I'll be whoever, like Brett said, I'll be whoever I need to be to make our friendship peaceful and to be chosen. That, that's the word that I kept, like, that kept coming up as I was getting ready for this is to be chosen. Wow. I think mm -hmm. that's a powerful word. Yeah. And I suspect resonates with, if you heard the collective, hmm, you know. Because um, I think there is something like in all of us, you know, that wants that, but then how does it manifest? You know, how, right. who do we become so that we're chosen? And for some right. people, it's totally different. You know, some people yeah. become like achievers. I'm going to win everything, you know. But for you, it played out in this, you know, this way. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, how about um, just other, like, key relationships in your life? You know, did, did this play out in other places or ways? I mean, it has. I, um, I... As I was actually, as I was getting ready for this, I um, realized, I think it did in, when I was dating Scott, the separation part, the separation anxiety. It hadn't really clicked for me, but when we were dating, that was a really hard thing for me. I mean, it totally changed when we got married. I think, you know, like once we were married, I knew, well, okay, fine, he's mine. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but for sure there. Um, and it's, there, there's different parts of it that I struggle with in all of my relationship, but I think the biggest one is losing myself. And I mean, to the point that like, I will, I mean, this is kind of a nine thing too, but um, my thoughts, my opinions, my feelings, I will adopt everybody else's. Like, I, I struggle having my own. I need approval from people to make decisions. Like, all of that is a struggle for me. And there's not, I mean, I don't think there's any other relationship that I have struggled with codependency as much as that one, but there's definitely little pieces of it everywhere. Yeah. So, like we mentioned, um, this is, you know, hasn't just been something you've had a realization like two weeks ago or something like this has been right. sort of years that you realize like, oh, wow, okay, I need to start functioning in some new ways. So could you share, I guess, a little bit of like, you know, whatever language you want to use, but you know, what has, has God taught you? What, how have you grown into operating in, you know, less or non-codependent mm -hmm. ways? You know, like what has that part of it been like? And, you know, um, yeah, what have you learned, basically, about how to do it, like, better? Yeah. Um, well, I am in no way an expert. <laughs> I'm still learning and still practicing this. Um, and it still scares me. But, I mean, I'm going to say it over and over again, but therapy was the biggest thing. And really, the reason why is because I was able to speak really hard truths about myself to someone and say them out loud. And it was a safe space. I knew there would be no judgment. I knew she wasn't going to be shocked, you know? And, um, and until you can say those hard things out loud, you can't do anything about them. They can be ideas all day long, but, you know, it wasn't until I was able to say them to her and she was able to 
you know, just like she couldn't like grab me in her arms because it was through a TV. But it's just like that warm hug, you know, like it's okay. We're going to get through this. We're going to work through it. And um, the first, I have a few things that I was going to talk about. The first one was boundaries. And I've already talked about this, but this was the biggest thing. And not like I went to my friends and I said, you know, this is a boundary if you cross it that's it. Like, you know, it wasn't like that. I didn't go talk to my friends about these boundaries, <laughs> but it was boundaries that I set for myself because, I mean, it was codependency. So, um, it was me. It was, I was the one who needed the boundaries for myself. And, um, they were little boundaries along the way. Like every week, I think there was probably a new boundary I was working on creating for myself. I did, I do have a couple of examples. One of them was, um, just, and this one was, I was able to practice it in my marriage, um, but this was one that I struggled with a lot with her, um, but I also struggle with it with Scott, and, um, but it's taking everything personally, like his actions, they're not mine, and separating myself from that, just like her actions were not mine. If she did something, I didn't have to own it. I could separate myself from that, but I would I would try to fix it because I, I took it so personally. And so um, I've been able to work on that with Scott, like in my relationship with Scott and not like letting his actions be his and I don't have to try to fix it or make excuses for it or, you know, whatever, like they're his. Um, and then the other one was my own time. And while I am, like I do love doing things for people, um, and I really do, and I, you know, but making sure that I'm not using all my energy on everybody else and that I'm taking time for myself because I can't, I, because I'm an introvert too, I can't, I can't give from an empty cup, you know, like I, I have to take time for myself, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Brandy. Yeah. Thank you so much for, I, I, th I think this topic in particular, especially in a Christian context, we're always emphasizing like, love others, be there for them, empathize, you know, and that's true. Yes, do that. And yet there is some line of like, but I'm like, not you, you know, yeah. and I can't literally like take everything, you know, like there's mm -hmm. some kind of a visible barrier that we kind of cross and all of a sudden it's not healthy for us or them. Right. And I just, I think it's incredibly insightful, the journey you've been on, so. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can y'all give her a hand? Leave it on. All right. Um, next is my good friend, Will Humble. Come on up, y'all give him a hand as he comes. So my first um, interaction, like at least like face-to-face -face interaction with Will was um, uh, probably, it was a while ago, well over a year ago, but we went to the 1418 coffee shop in Plano and got to hang out. And um, something that immediately stood out to me about Will was that he um, was incredibly like straightforward and honest. I don't know if you've had some interactions with Will, but like he's going to tell you the truth. You know, and I really appreciate that uh, about you, Will. And uh, if you don't know him, I hope you get a chance to, to meet him. And he is a little bit nervous tonight, more than a little bit. But, um, but you have our love. You have our love and our support. So thank you for sharing tonight. Um, so really, in order to, um, well, maybe I guess first share a little bit just you know, who you are, how you found the table, kids, you know, some of that info. My name is William Henry Humble the yes. Third. Uh, Will Humble. So there's a Bible verse, Second Chronicles seven fourteen in the NIV version. That's important. God says that He will hear from heaven. He will forgive your sin and heal, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Will humble. 
you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are Bible names. I have a Bible name. <laughs> so I grew up in a tiny, tiny Texas town. One Walmart, two sisters, and no brothers. Since 2002, to earn a living, I've been doing FBI work with aliens. Aliens as in non-citizens. So FBI just stands for Family Based Immigration. FBI, ha ha ha. I also do employment based immigration and asylum and citizenship and other stuff. It's never a dull moment. In 2017, I moved to Plano, Texas. I'm divorced. I have four kids, ages three, five, seven, and 14. They live in Wiley, Texas with their mom and with their uncle, who is gay. He is my ex-brother-in-law. So we may not be brother-in-laws anymore, but he'll always be their uncle. I found the table, this church, because I Googled gay affirming churches near me. And a website popped up called gaychurch.org. And then there was this list. So I went down the list. I just started visiting lots and lots and lots of different churches. Not fun, um, but good, good for me. There was one, um, Greenland Hills Methodist Church in Dallas is where I met Pastor Carrie Smith, who introduced me to Pastor Gary Fox, who introduced me to Don Jacobs. Have you all heard of Don? Well, here I am. <laughs> Connect the dots. Yeah, so that's how I made it here. Cool. So in order to, to understand your story, um, it's really important, I think, to kind of know your church you know, background, since it, um, like you did not grow up a nominal church attender, you know, Christer, Christmas, Easter attendant, like, no, 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 your family, like y'all were in and um, and that whole culture, it really powerfully, you know, influenced you. So can you talk to us a little bit about that experience, how it shaped who, you know, in many ways um, you were, and maybe to some degree are, but, but primarily were? My church background. Um, I called it Super Baptist. Have you <laughs> heard of Bill Gothard? Um, no card playing, no smoking, no drinking, no dancing. No rock music, not even Christian rock, because that has a syncopated beat, the devil's beat. No TV, no not homeschooling. A mentor actually said out loud that a Christian who sends his kids to public school is sinning. No dating, no premarital eye contact. I literally never gave a compliment because that might lead her heart astray. As a male, I was obligated to never tempt a female. If she were to develop a crush, that would be my sin. No birth control. Children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. My, this worldview prized huge families. Duggar huge. Um, my ex-wife is one of nine children, so I thought I was going to sire even more than that. <laughs> you take over the world your way, I'll take over the world my way. <laughs> no divorce. So yeah, it, it influenced me in every, in every way. But I thought I was happy, and my, I was happy. I embraced this whole worldview. I happily followed that blueprint. I did not date. I courted, and even when I was courting my then fiance, we agreed, I was happy with this, it was even her request, no kissing. We will not kiss until the minister says, you may now kiss the bride. I didn't know any different, so I thought this was all good and normal. Well, abnormal, but in a good way. It was special, extraordinary. I was even arrogant, knowing that I was in and all y'all sinners were out. 
So this exclusive worldview influenced all of my actions and all of my attitudes. I was frankly a holier than thou, judgmental jerk. Like I said, straightforward. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened? You know, like how do you go from that kind of background, that world, and then you're searching, you know, gay churches near me? You know, like how, yeah, what, what were some of the events or things that led you to a place of like kind of crisis and like, okay, wow, I can't keep doing that, that thing? My worldview failed when my marriage failed. My church friends weren't friends anymore. Nobody called me. Now, in their defense, I didn't call them either. So I guess the phone works both ways. But still, a friendship like that is pff, worthless. This whole experience was heartbreaking. And while my divorce was pending, I was diagnosed with cancer. I went through surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, all that physical pain gave me perspective. So now I have sympathy and so much appreciation. My father was the only person in my life. So I thank God for him. I, I never hated God. I never felt like God left me, but all of the Adults in my life disappeared. Zero. So I kind of hated everybody else. <laughs> um, and that sent me searching. This was a, a death of my past, the death of my marriage, the death of the old me. All of that sent me searching, and I was mourning the death of the old me. I literally sat in my car crying, calling suicide prevention hotline, but even that felt totally pathetic because I wasn't serious about suicide. And so I would apologize to these hotline workers for wasting their time. But that was a safe person to talk to. Who else are you gonna talk to? Someone from your old world? <laughs> no. Um, so there were some defining moments in this um, change. May 13 of 2019, I stumbled across a book called God Believes in Love. Great book. This guy, Mr. Robinson. It was like the gas in the engine that fueled my 180 degree turn. And then in June of 2019, that's when the family court judge in Collin County signed the divorce. So that was the end of an old chapter in my life. And I decided to take that defining moment as a new chapter. I opened my mind to a whole new worldview. Uh, now that I was no longer in the box of marriage, so to speak, I've been legally set free. Now what? Maybe, maybe I could start asking questions. Before, I, I wasn't even allowed to ask the question, much less answer the question, what about me? What do I really feel um, about everything? Life, death, sexual orientation. I let myself ask questions and start answering them and stop lying. July 3rd, coincidentally, it's the day before Independence Day, I had my first spiritual direction session, like, like counseling, sort of, but with a pastor, and it was over the phone. He was in California. Matt Nightingale was his name. He was the first person that I'd ever encountered that was anything like me. He used to be married, had four kids, now he's divorced, he's gay, and he doesn't hate God, and he still goes to church. That just blew my mind. And then August was the first time I met somebody face to face. That was Pastor Gary Fox. Somebody like me, I'm not the only one. So that was a huge stepping stone in this world tour, <laughs> my worldview one 180 degree turn tour change. Those were big steps. Yeah, yeah, um, big steps. That's like, these are some huge transitions. Can you share with us a little bit, like, so, like, how would you describe where you are now? You know, so like you've had, you start off in this place, you have the divorce, you have these huge upheavals, and it's like you mentioned this, you know, uh, the 180 degree turn, 
and then, you know, it, but it's been a while, kind of like Brittany, and all this didn't happen two weeks ago, like you're talking some of the dates, you know, 2019, you know, so you've, you've had some time to process this. How would you describe, like, where, you know, kind of where you are now, like some of the changes you've made, you know, things like that? Old Will would say that the idea that you're born this way is no excuse. If you're born a kleptomaniac, you ha have to suppress those urges. Pray the steal away. But now, <laughs> new will, now will, it, it sees it more like being left-handed. I'm not gonna pray my left away. <laughs> By the way, do you know why left-handed people will never sit on the right hand of God? No. Because they would bump elbows. <laughs> Sorry, dad joke. <laughs> But now, today, I wear three hats. I have my go-to-work hat. It fits good. I, my coworkers, my clients, the paperwork, the people work, it's all good. Then every other weekend and two nights a week with my kids, that hat fits good. It's all candy and cartoons. We're in a good routine. And I think little by little, you know, I remind them to say please and thank you. It's developmental. It's, it's good. It's my circus. The third hat is like here now. This is so uncomfortable. <laughs> this is so weird and out of my comfort zone and trying to find people who don't hate God but who are open-minded and inclusive, not exclusive. Um, but it still hurts. It's, I don't feel safe talking to people. And um, I guess if, if you're comfortable, you're not growing. So being growing means you're uncomfortable. So uncomfortable is good. Um, a really good thing about all this is the freedom. I finally have some freedom from shame, freedom from lying and hiding, freedom to, uh, freedom from fear-based religion and honesty. I can quit lying to myself and quit looking at the Bible through a, a lens of misinterpretation that is based on flawed translations. Uh, what has been hard? After a lifetime of lying to myself and others, it is hard to take off that mask. It is just automatic to say, everything is fine, and smile. Um, did you already ask me how the table has been helpful? I haven't, but go for it. <laughs> Unless it hasn't been, then we can just move on. I said I, would, I, I couldn't do this if I didn't have the questions in advance, and one of the questions he gave me was, how has the table, uh, or has the table, has, is there any way the table's been helpful? In this journey, yes, the table has helped me feel not alone and to have a safe place to talk. I've been going to a small group where I met Abby and Katie, and they told me about a book called Love Wins. Wow. Um, I didn't even know there was another layer to the cult that I grew up in. Um, That's another area where my past influenced all my actions and attitude. It's even when I was a kindergartner, I asked Jesus into my heart based on fear, this idea of permanent conscious torture. So I asked Jesus into my heart because I was terrified of hell. Now, that cheap level of faith did grow. I didn't, it wasn't just that. As a teenager, you know, I had faith and loved God, and it's real. Um, but to get away from this idea that it's all about escaping hell is another mind-blowing freedom. But what about that question? So am I saying it doesn't matter who you pray to because we're all going to the same heaven anyway? Jesus doesn't matter? Jesus does matter. He is the why and the how of heaven even now here on earth. And here at the table, I, I can talk about those kinds of things without being a heretic or heresy or getting shunned from my cult. So I'm learning that hell, quote unquote, isn't necessarily a destination, period. It's a process with a refining purpose. And I want my kids to learn that too. I don't want them to always think, do this, don't do that, or you'll go to hell, you're going to hell, or they're going to hell. <laughs> I want them to know that God's love isn't exclusive, it's inclusive, it's unconditional. I'm so proud of my kids because they even told me, hey, Santa Claus, isn't that conditional love? <laughs> Yes, let's have some joy and peace and kindness. <laughs> what, um, what would the, the will of today, like what maybe word, phrase, advice, input, what would you tell the will of the past? Don't bother with Dr. Weiss. His materials were aimed at how to stay in an unfaithful marriage, and that was not a right fit. Don't, don't listen to so-called Christian counselors. 
Um, snapping rubber bands every time you have a left-handed thought? No. Don't lose hope. It, gets, it does get better. Uh, do question old ways. It's okay to have doubt. It's okay to ask why and why not and keep asking. Ask for help. Don't wait for people to be mind readers and know to ask. You have to initiate. So take the initiative. There's a, another verse that I want to share, Romans 6, 6 to 7. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Hmm. We're set free, so let's live already. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's incredibly beautiful. I can see, like, just getting to know you the past year especially, I can see you just stepping more and more into that freedom. I remember we had the uh, October, because Halloween fell on a Sunday this year, so we did our, you know, outdoor kind of uh, trunk or treat event, and and there was Will, you know, with your, your station, and you were setting it all up, and I was like, how are you? And you were just like, I'm great, and you could see like a, like a joy, and you were, I mean, in light of your background, I can tell like why that's such a big deal for you. I'm guessing Halloween wasn't like on the thumbs up list probably of the past, you know? Um, and, but it's you just learning to like relax a little bit and love people and experience joy and that I, it's it's really incredible to watch so thank you for making the journey and and for us having the chance to like witness it it's really beautiful we're grateful thank you will thanks yeah. thanks y'all give him a hand good stuff good stuff that's the um the something that god is up to you know, in each of us. So as we kind of come into this year, um, I want us all to be kind of reflecting and looking backwards, but also looking ahead to say like, okay, God, what do you have for me? How am I being stretched? How am I growing? What's the thing God's doing? Uh, and to press into that because it matters. Like it doesn't just matter for you and your family or your friends, but even like us as a community and it ripples out, you know, I mean, a Brittany a will, like those changes and transformations, that's rippling out into their whole life. Uh, and so it, it matters. So let it encourage us to um, love Christ and move forward as well. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I, um, I just thank you for the good work that you're doing in Brittany's life, in Will's life, and the ripple effects that are happening in and through them and for all of us, God. You're up to something beautiful in each and every one of us. So right now, God, we just um, we open up our hearts, our minds to what you're up to in our life this year. And we even now say yes to it, God, knowing it will be challenging, knowing there will be times where we feel despair and feel like giving up. And yet we trust that you're present. We trust that you're with us, that your spirit is filling us and you are forming us into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful work. So we love you, God. It's in the powerful, wonderful, life-giving name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.